Welcome, everyone. I um, just want to start out by saying we're going to run this webinar in two ways. We're going to first have our, our presentations from our speakers, and we'll run it as a typical Zoom webinar. And then for those listening, we're going to allow everyone to come into the same room together, and then we can have some Q&A, 45 minutes or so of Q&A with everyone in the group. So once, um, once the um, presentations are done, We'll, we'll bring everyone together. So prepare all your questions and you can uh, present them in person, so to speak, or live with each other afterwards. Um, we will video the first part, but the second part discussion, we won't do a video. All right, so now I'll do the formal introduction to get us going. So welcome everyone to the DCI webinar on situating dynamic competition and evolution beyond Chicago which is based on a DCI working paper by Nicolas Petit, Thibault Chappelle, and myself. My name is Bo Hyden, and our mission at DCI is to develop an advanced innovation-based dynamic competition theories, tools, and policy processes adjusted for the nature and pace of innovation in the 21st century. We call this competition policy for a dynamic world. DCI is hosted by UC Berkeley, EUI, and VU Amsterdam. We run a number of programs with different stakeholder groups, including policymakers, law and economics professionals, industry representatives, and academics. In particular, we run the Dynamic Competition Policy Lab, the Young Scholars Program, and industry roundtables, in, in addition to academic events as we have today. Today's webinar will start with a presentation of the working paper by Nicolas Petit, and will follow with four discussions by Doug Melamed, Eleanor Fox, Keith Hilton and Renata Hesse. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Nicola Petit, the professor of competition law and head of the law department of the European University Institute. The floor is yours, Nicola. Thank you very much, Bo. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. So um, I want to key off by thanking my colleagues, uh, Renata, Eleanor, Keith and Doug for um, accepting to participate in this discussion. Uh, it was a very hard paper to write. Um, it's not an easy paper to write because it's very hard to study the Chicago School. There has been a ton of writings on the Chicago School, um, a lot of attention to secondary sources, probably less attention to primary sources. Uh, but also it's a very difficult topic to the extent that uh, it's hardly contested and it's very hard to try to chart a, a middle ground in, in the very polarized conversation that is uh, currently uh, taking place in the antitrust world. So um, I'm going to try to explain what we tried to do in the paper and the main messages that you can find in the document uh, that is available on SSRN and on our website. Um, of course, this is work in progress and we are actually here to discuss how to improve the piece of work. Okay, so um, let me start by maybe you know, saying that um, from certainly a European perspective, but I'm sure our American colleagues uh, relate to that, um, the polar ends of the current antitrust conversation are dominated by what you may call neoconservative views. Um, on the one hand, you have the neo Brandazian agenda that wants to return to early 20th century antitrust law, considering that large firms, they are attorneys, they are lobbyists, they are Higher academics are um, not just influencing markets, but also politics. And uh, we should return to the principle that guided antitrust uh, law application and development in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century. On the other side, you find people that really like the case of the federal courts developed from the you know, 1960s to 1970s to today, and especially the uh, foundational principles on which that case law is built, and especially the idea that false positives uh, condemning innocent firms, uh, just if the risk of condemning innocent firms justify justifies limited antitrust enforcement and very high burdens on plaintiffs. So both these um, stances are quite conservative to the extent that they repeat very old principles and both tend to refute the idea that um, economic, legal, and technological transformation uh, may require a novel consideration of established legal rules and precedents. 
uh, not just a reversion to previous paradigms. So um, dynamic competition for us, uh, for Tibobo and myself, um, looks like a pretty natural progression, intellectual progression for antitrust uh, law and policy. And it's not a new it's not a new idea. So they are aware in some merger instruments, some statements about innovation and, and dynamic competition. You can see some of that on the slide. Today, uh, cases in the US and the EU increasingly refer to a dynamic competition. Sometimes the attention is mostly nominal, more than analytical. Um, sometimes the attention is mostly about um, uh, you know, making statements which have no bearing on the cases, but there is a lot of interest into this, and we can see agencies across the world uh, develop some uh, thinking about dynamic competition. Less in the in the in the literature, some works are emerging on the development of of practical tools such as capabilities assessments to evaluate and uh, diagnose uh, existence or lack thereof of of dynamic competition. All right, so um, some uh, past and uh, contemporary critics have associated dynamic competition with the Chicago School of Antitrust. And um, as I'm saying this, I'm actually thinking of a very recent paper that appeared in um, a very important journal in the field that makes very explicit uh, the, the idea that um, these I the theories about innovation and the concern about protecting innovation and dynamic competition is actually just another, uh, another you know, brick on the Chicago wall or another um, you know, song that uh, Chicagoans cloaked under the veneer of the language of innovation are trying to, to advance. So there would be a sort of you know, Chicagoan fifth column type of argument behind all these calls for dynamic competition and innovation. Um, you know, part of this critique says that the approach, you know, that tries to talk about innovation essentially tries to weaken antitrust laws protection of rivalry. I think even more hyper hypercritically, the, the neo Brandeisian movement that attempts to eclipse the Chicago school has tried itself to pretend that its structuralist anti-monopoly agenda concerned itself with the protection of dynamic competition. And you can see part of this in the new merger guidelines, which talk a lot about the trends towards concentration and the risk for innovation. Um, it's dynamic, true, but it's not really what dynamic competition is about. So our paper is essentially concerned um, with trying to uh, explain that um, dynamic competition from an, an epistemological standpoint, I'm sorry for the very wordy concept here, uh, doesn't have you know so much to do with the Chicago School. It shares common blood with it, but it's it's also quite different. And I think the paper has to be thought as a trying to explain that uh, concerns about dynamic competition, or at least our concerns with dynamic competition, share some common ground with the Chicago School, uh, but differ in substantial ways uh, from the tenets of um, that school. So I want to explain in the next minutes a little bit. What are the similarities and the differences between the Chicago School and, uh, dynamic, and the dynamic competition initiative, movement, school, whatever you call it? Um, I'm not here to pretend that we are um, representing a school, just a series of concerns about markets and, and economic prosperity. All right. So um, in the paper, we try to explain that the Chicago School of Antitrust um, had as a main contribution, the adherence to several key principles intended to simplify the fact-finding and ana analytical tasks required in antitrust cases. So in our papers, we list 13 of these principles or rules or norms. Um, I'll just focus mostly on, on six here. Um, so the first one, is an economic rule. It says that um, economic concentration is not an out is is an outcome. Sorry, not a determinant of the conditions of competition. Monopoly, in a nutshell, may be the result of efficiency. And um, you know, from a practical standpoint, the high prices that you see in concentrated markets might be just a legitimate and 
useful reward for efficient uh, business behavior or transaction. The second economic rule that we highlight in the paper is this idea that entry barriers are rare and short-lived, and that mostly and only artificial entry barriers like government licensing should be challenged. Policy rules, I'm just going to give you some few examples of these uh, policy norms that the Chicago School of Antitrust uh, developed. You, I'm sure you'll know. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm absolutely, I know you'll know this. Um, the policy rules. So, you know, one of them was that, you know, merger policy should be permissive. Most mergers are efficient unless the transaction involves very large firms or leads to a monopoly. Another policy rule is that antitrust enforcement is for the marginal case. It's valuable in some very special circumstances or situations in which it can achieve results faster than uh, market forces. But these circumstances are, are deemed to be extremely rare in judicialized systems of, of law enforcement. Some rules also on evidence or the treatment of facts, um, ideas like the fact that observable market trends should not be ignored on the grounds of idealized uh, statements or speculations about future, stealth, future or past say, states of the world. If prices go down, if we can see that prices go down and output goes up, that should be good enough and there should be no intervention in such shit situations. Another evidentiary principle or guiding rule from the Chicago School with this idea that the prices in markets and, and output reveal the preferences in, of consumers. And, and an example of this is the idea that uh, if there's a lot of concentration of output within one firm, it may just be that the consumers prefer the product of that company, uh, not from others. So these are very few basic ideas from the Chicago School. I picked six, but you know there are more, and they're explained in the in the paper. Now, let's just um, you know go to the common ground between dynamic competition and the Chicago School. So we in the paper say that there are essentially four touch points. The first one is a shared skepticism. The Chicago School challenged the narrative that concentrated industries led to higher prices in the context of um, increased free trade uh, with a lot of product and technologi technological competition from, from Asia. Uh, dynamic competition also starts with uh, a position of skepticism about the new mainstream narrative of rising monopoly power. Um, if you think about it, I mean, you know, today's mainstream narrative of rising monopoly power doesn't make a lot of sense in light of the visible reality of cutthroat competition in space travel, electrical automation, or or even digital platforms. And this is, you know, uh, of course um, disputed, but um, I, we think there is um, credence to the argument that uh, it's not all clear that uh, everything you see in digital is is all or most monopoly power. Second touch point. Dynamic competition adheres to the idea that um, mainstream microeconomic theory should be the method for antitrust law adjudication and rulemaking. Predictions about the consequences of industry structure and business behavior cannot rest on claims, conjectures, anecdotes, or possibility theorems. Antitrust law application should remain grounded in demonstration and data. The third touch point is um, also. Um, this idea that the function of antitrust should be tethered to um, um, a welfare function, um, a welfare criterion, material welfare of consumers must be provided as a condition precedent to moral welfare. Um, and you know, we explain the reasons for this. There are logical and ethical reasons for this. And um, I don't want to dwell on this, but it's very clear in our view that um, the function of antitrust should be about promoting welfare. The fourth touch point with the Chicago School is this idea that um, there is an absence of association um, between limitations of competition by collusion or monopolization and adverse effects on welfare. You cannot associate, you cannot correlate uh, reductions in rivalry with automatic reductions in welfare. And therefore, an, an additional filter is required, is required for antitrust intervention. Uh, 
In mainstream antitrust law, this has been the, the function of the consumer welfare standard, which uh, required more than just uh, a showing of reductions um, of rivalry or increased or, or increased concentration in the market. And we do believe indeed that um, there is a need for such additional filter and to maintain such an additional filter in antitrust law and policy. Okay, now let me go to the differences because I think this is really where the paper makes um, the main uh, its main contribution. So we tend to disagree with the Chicagoan view about institutions. So recall that um, Chicagoan considered that antitrust institutions are important to deal with economic complexity. Um, there are some words in some papers that we read, which almost say that judges are completely ignorant. And that, uh, on the other hand, agencies are very costly to uh, run and also very prone to industrial or economic capture. The bottom line of this very, this very bleak picture of institutional capabilities has been to recommend that judges and agencies focus on the very simple stuff, which is mergers to monopoly and cartels and ignore the other types of business behavior and transactions where prediction is very uneasy, is more uneasy. So we in you know, our paper believe and explain why we believe that agencies and courts can learn and they are not completely impotent or ignorant. Um, more important, we also consider that agency and judicial intervention might be the price to pay to derive empirical knowledge and learning from the cases, even when wrong, to increase the stock of facts that we have and answer hard questions such as whether antitrust law must be improved, changed, or adjusted. We need a base of facts and the judicial and agency processes can provide such facts. So error might have to be the price to pay to increase and improve uh, antitrust enforcement. The second, uh, I think, key deviation from dynamic competition from Chicago School has to do with a very different view, I think, of market rivalry and antitrust enforcement. So I, I Professor Fox has wrote about this in the past, the Chicago guideline of protect competition, not competitors that are less efficient, um, we believe deserve some relaxation in some special cases. And the special cases are cases in which today's inefficient rivals can improve their competitiveness by internal growth, improvements in management, acquisitions, or collaboration. Um, one you know, obvious and very simple case that we explain in the paper is the case that you see when um, a rival leveraging modern technology tries to uh, reach a lower average and marginal cost than an incumbent, um, and the incumbent, uh, faced with the threat of entry, uses pricing and non-pricing devices to deny the rival the scale needed to become more efficient. Um, we can see this when we think about license caps trying to, you know, leverage a lot, a lot of tact I mean, use a lot of tactics to prevent and drive out ride-sharing platforms from from local transportation markets. Right, third difference, uh, regulation. The Chicago School of Antitrust envisioned antitrust law mostly as rules of the game. Tim, Ru Tim Wu wrote about this. Uh, courts and agencies serve the role of a referee and the Chicagoans recognized, recognized two clear fouls in market competition, cartels and merger to monopoly. I said this before. All the rest of the free fights, I think in the dynamic competition mindsets, um, Antitrust law is envisioned as something that's a bit more dynamic. Uh, the rules of the game can evolve. I mean, I, I like to do soccer metaphors. I know our friends here on the panel are mostly American, so I won't bore you with a soccer metaphor, but I have no better alternative to offer. So I'm very sorry about this, but we've seen a lot of addition of new fouls in, in soccer in past decades. And we believe antitrust law should follow the same process. You know, there's um, not, not you know, very good empirical reason to say that the fouls of cartels and mergers to monopoly are the only ones that should um, uh, that should be uh, punished, and um, and that should be the case forever and ever and ever. As the game is played, experience develops, and the rules of the game should develop as well. Now, in addition to this um, idea of the rules of the game, we 
in, in this role of the antitrust agencies in courts as referees, um, if I can play with the metaphor a little more, a lot of antitrust laws today consider that agencies and courts should play a more managerial role in the economy. So I'm not talking here about industrial policy, but I'm talking here about doing some things that are a little more than just being the referee. And, and that may mean placing more emphasis on questions, for instance, of, of growth of the business enterprises, right? So when you think about this question of growth, uh, the set of questions that you may put emphasis on as an antitrust in investigator might be slightly different. I mean, these are things that antitrust agencies work with, but maybe the emphasis should be placed more increasingly on these issues. So if you think about section one cases, you know, one typical question that you may ask under a dynamic competition lens is, is the agreement preventing a firm from growing into a more efficient or innovative firm in the future? And the focus is not necessarily on becoming more efficient than the incumbents, but becoming more efficient than today. Uh, section two, same stuff, is the business practice suspected of unlawful monopolization preventing a firm today growing into a more efficient or innovative firm in the future? And in merger control, I think the example is even more clear. The question would be, is um, could the merging firm grow more independently or in combination with other firms absent the transactions bringing under... Um, it's or them a higher share of outputs. All right, so these are the set of questions that uh, dynamic consumption minded people like to think about. Uh, are there combinations or transactions that would allow uh, a firm different from the incumbent, for instance, to grow more in the future? Okay, um, last but not least, um, a key departure from the Chicago School is the attention paid to innovation about dynamic competition. So a dynamic competition mind would take very seriously the idea that technological innovation is endogenous. That is that innovation stems from capital accumulation, including human capital. And this is important because the question of innovation estimation in cases then would require a special treatments that lies in the study of the internal workings of the organization and the groups and individuals working inside them. Uh, conventional microeconomics never really developed good tools to study the endogenous impacts of business behavior and transactions on the internal working of companies and organizations. We proxy innovation in a lot of cases so we correlate reductions in rivalry with reductions in innovation. Um, we, can, we proxy innovation for the quality dimension of a product or a service, but that's, I think, not good enough for someone who works in, in this idea of dynamic competition or, or capabilities. All right, I'll be very quick on, on the end. Um, I, I really wanna close with just a few words about what this may mean in practice, and again, the agenda that we have before us is not set. Um, that's, you know, may, that may upset some people. I mean, we are living in a time where people want quick answers to hard questions. Uh, I think what we are trying to say here is we need to study more. Um, but what we can study um, is actually more clear. Um, so we can use a merger review context to illustrate. Under current law, at least in the EU, but I'm sure it's pretty much the same in the US, Merger agencies, at least as the low states, it tend to try to remedy harms between a period of, you know, more or less two years. Um, and of course, in practice, this time horizon may be extended, but it's pretty clear in everyone's mind that um, a general extension, orders of magnitude of the time dimension by, say, 10 to 15 years is a, is a fool's errand, right? So there is this idea that we can't just, you know, control for impacts on innovation in, in the long term, it's very hard. Now, a dynamic competition approach to mergers poses a different question. The question is not so much about predicting and controlling you know, whether innovation will be higher or lower in the long term. The question is, can the relevant firms grow equally absent the merger? And if the answer is no, of course, the merger should be allowed. If the answer is yes, the merger should be challenged. Uh, because there is in the law a presumption that 
organic growth is better than external um, growth by companies. Now, this, these questions are the questions that people should have asked themselves. We believe in reviewing mergers like the Facebook Instagram transaction or the Facebook Giphy transaction, but these questions were not the ones examined during these transactions. Now, there is also a possibility of refinements. Um, so if the answer is yes, that is that the, merge, the merging parties could grow equally absent the merger, then the question becomes, but are these opportunities for growth provided by organic um, um, organic uh, growth by, you know, addition of capital, um, going to capital markets, getting um, infusions of money and um, uh, funding, or are they provided by external growth? So, you know, one question that you may ask yourself is if there is a bigger opportunity for growth outside of the merge transaction with another company, um, is that combination better, right? And agencies do not think these ways today. They do not ask themselves is, if a merger between Facebook if, if, and Instagram, um, um, if a merger between Facebook and Instagram uh, is not as good as a merger, for instance, between Microsoft and Instagram or Google and Instagram. So a question that typically a dynamic competition mindset would have to ask itself would be to review the landscape of capability combinations available in the market and think a little bit about which combination will provide the higher opportunities for growth. Now, you may say this comes very close to industrial policy, but we believe that under the right procedural arrangements, this could be a very useful way of thinking for agencies when they review mergers. All right, so in the past, just one word, in the past, uh, to, to close, in the past, agencies have done these sort of capabilities combination evaluations and in the past um, uh, we have seen an anecdotes in the markets derived from antitrust cases in which the capability at least implicit assessment at least implicit in some procedures was about right the visa plate merger as we explained in 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 the paper um, the facts really show that the agencies got it right um, played um, which was the target of the transaction which never took place uh, managed to raise a lot of money after the transaction because it, according to the markets, had the right capabilities to to grow into a, a pretty formidable competitor. Um, so um, maybe the DOJ got it right here, but it was not very explicit in in the documents that uh, we have. All right. So really, you know, the point here is to say that the challenge that we are facing if we want to develop this agenda is to identify good indicators and data points for capabilities evaluation, identify actionable questions that antitrust agencies can ask themselves to understand better the impacts of business conduct and transactions on dynamic competition slash innovation. And uh, we believe that the business and management literature has some pointers to provide. Uh, we need a lot of people to work on this with us. We don't have answers, but I think we are starting to understand what are the key questions. Thanks for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Great, Nicola. Thanks so much for getting us off, kicking us off. Uh, so now I would like to welcome Doug Melamed. Doug is a visiting fellow at the Stanford Law School and a scholar in residence at the USC Gould School of Law. Doug has a broad experience from many senior positions with government, the DOJ, industry, Intel, and private practice, Wilmer Hale. Looking forward to hear what you have to say, Doug. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Bowman, and, and thanks, Nicola, for, for a good presentation and, and, and a really, I think, really important and valuable paper, which I think I think will, will uh, be influential and, and contribute importantly to, to the conversation. But I think it needs to be put more precisely in context. And in the few minutes I have, I'm going to try to explain those two propositions. So as to the first point, over the past few years, like most of, most of you, I suppose, I, I've uh, uh, often heard proponents of reform, the new Brandeisians and the dynamic competition folks, either reiterate their views and the language is best suited for the chorus of the already convinced, or lament that their views have not moved the needle of legal doctrine. And what I keep thinking when I hear that is that by contrast to the Chicago school in and around the 1970s, uh, these proponents of change don't have a product. 
The new brand dioceses have a lot of complaints. They plainly want more aggressive antitrust enforcement, but they really have not explained what that means. The closest they've come, I suppose, is, are, are the new merger guidelines. Uh, but happily, those guidelines, the final version, <laughs> not the draft, uh, could have been written by mainstream post-Chicago folks uh, with, whose names and pedigrees are no doubt familiar to you. By contrast, sh the Chicago folks had a product, a coherent and comprehensive theory. It's supported by extensive, albeit incomplete and contested empirical work at the level of the antitrust case. Uh, and nicely summarized in Robert Bork's antitrust paradox, which notwithstanding its flaws, was a tour de force. Until today, to my knowledge, the dynamic competition folks didn't have a product either. Uh, lots of discussion about the inadequacies of mainstream I.O. economics, lots of discussion about the value of the work of business school scholars, about competence and capabilities of business entities, but no theory of what all that means for legal doctrine other than not the current doctrine and modes of thinking. And that's where I think this paper, Situating Dynamic Competition, com uh, comes in. It's a much needed beginning of the answer to the question, what alternative to the current approaches to competition law are you proposing? And it is convincing um, in this discussion, I think, of, of the, uh, the comparison of what it's thinking about and Chicago. It preserves some of the very good features of Chicago, in particular the focus on economic welfare, but it convincingly demonstrates that it's not just warmed over Chicago. In fact, in many ways, it's profoundly different from Chicago. The paper is also notable for repeatedly expressing confidence that the insights and arguments of dynamic competition can be made operational within existing institutions. Although on this point, I think it clearly contemplates and begins to outline a regulatory model, not a law enforcement model. And it thus raises, but does not discuss difficult questions about first regulation, especially in the context of competition and innovation, which have traditionally thought to flourish most in decentralized environments. And second, how to fit dynamic competition into existing law enforcement-based competition institutions. But the paper is an important and valuable beginning. So let me turn now to the second question, how to put some of this in context, in the context of competition law. And so let's start with the foundation. Competition law, and by that I mean U.S. antitrust law and EU competition law, uh, is about uh, 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 prohibiting bad conduct, period. U.S. law, and now I'm referring specifically to Sherman 1 and 2 and Clayton 7, prohibits certain con agreements, the act of monopolizing and certain mergers. It does not prohibit being big or not innovating or mistreating workers. Similarly, EU competition law, Articles 101 and 102, prohibits uh, certain kinds of agreements and abuse of dominant position. So how does competition, uh, dynamic competition, help us think about the line between permissible and impermissible conduct, between benign and anti-competitive conduct in actual cases? And, and, and what follows, I'm going to focus on innovation because I think that's central to the whole enterprise, dynamic competition enterprise. Well, dynamic competition folks tell us that innovation is really important, much more important than avoiding dead weight loss. And of course, uh, we, we've known that since Robert Solow's work about 60 years ago. But, but dynamic competition goes further. It emphasizes that innovation is not exogenous. It does not just happen to markets. It's influenced by and, and promoted or deterred by markets. And that's clearly correct and clearly important. One implication of the focus on innovation is that is, uh, that is emphasized by dynamic competition folks is their insistence that antitrust law needs to look beyond some kind of artificial two-year horizon. That it needs to reject, in, in light of learning over the past 50 years, the Chicago School notion that the antitrust project is inherently too complicated for antitrust institutions unless implemented by crude, oversimplified rules that will inevitably be replete with error costs, particularly false negatives, I think. And I think that, too, is clearly correct, provided that that does not mean, and I think Nicola made clear it does not mean, uh, that antitrust law must be based on specific predictions about unknowable future innovation. Instead, the way to extend the time horizon so that the implications of, of, of for innovation of the conduct at issue can be taken into account is to use current learning to make acceptably reliable judgments of the impact of that conduct on the likelihood of future innovation or growth, if you want to go in that direction, which Nicola was talking about and not going to be the central focus of my conference. 
The third big contribution to dynamic competition is its foundation, as I understand it, uh, uh, is the idea that the often simple, highly abstract, sometimes excessively mathematical models of current I.O. economics do not provide a sufficient basis for deciding any trust cases, at least to the extent that we want to know the impact of a conduct at issue on future innovation. Let me try to put that, I, I express that idea in different words. The I.O. economist models treat business entities as stick figures, abstraction. They asked about the abilities of the entities by listing their tangible assets. They asked about the incentives of the entities by imputing to them simplifying assumptions of IO economics and, and assuming, of course, that they're rational profit maximizers. Dynamic competition says to the contrary that business entities are collectives populated and run by human beings, and that the most important assets for their innovation prospects are what David Teese and others call their capabilities. And this is what Nicola was referring to about the internal competences uh, of the institution. These include human capital, culture of the entity, including its organizational structure, internal reward structure, and the like. These capabilities are intangibles, knowledge, experience, and skills, business model, and so forth. And I assume, by the way, although I didn't see this in the paper, that they also include intangibles resulting from market context, like the disabilities of dominant firms described by Clayton Christensen in his seminal book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and embodied in the uh, eponymous uh, Christensen effect. I think all this is very important and needs to be taken into account in, in antitrust law. But I don't think the discussion of dynamic competition, even in this very valuable paper, says what needs to be said about how to put the insights of dynamic competition into the context of antitrust law. So let me make suggest some steps here. First, we need to ask, when does all this stuff about innovation matter? Does it, does it really matter? For this, I'm going to talk about US antitrust law. I think what I'm saying is largely applicable in Europe. It's a more complicated conversation. Okay, that's law, conceptual level, one proposition. Private conduct that increases market power is illegal unless justified by welfare enhancing efficiencies for which it is reasonably necessary. That's it, two elements. Creation of market power, efficiency issues. The harm is increased market power. From that, some combination of higher prices, lower output, and lower product quality can be presumed. It doesn't have to be proven, nor does harm to innovation have to be proven. Um, in order to establish the requisite harm to competition element of, a, of an antitrust violation. Now, understanding these basic propositions has two relevant implications. First, it's part of the explanation, I think, of why innovation has rarely figured prominently in antitrust cases. And second, it means the impact of the conduct at issue on innovation is most likely to arise as a defense. It, it's going to arise when the defendant says, look, the conduct that you're accusing me of, that you say is, is, is aggrandizing my market power, uh, is, is reasonably necessary to increase the likelihood of innovation and to an extent sufficient to justify the conduct. So that's how it normally comes up, not the only way. That's normally how innovation would come into an antitrust case. So now we come to the second thing we have to ask, which is how do you evaluate this claim, this claim innovation effects? And this is where I think the paper and dynamic competition, uh, as I understand them, are incomplete. They correctly and importantly focus on the critically important aspect of ability and inclination or predisposition to innovate. But even there, they seem to focus on the ability of the defendant to innovate without regard to the impact of the conduct at issue on the ability of other parties to innovate. More important, the dynamic competition folks largely ignore the critically important question of incentive to innovate. And the abundant economic literature, including seminal work by Nobel laureate Kenneth Arrow and more recent empirical work that sheds light on the role of economic incentives and innovation. And in there, we actually know a lot. So here are some of the top line teachings of that literature. Let's start with the key teachings about incentives. Firms whose existing products and revenues would be jeopardized by new innovations have less incentive to innovate and to commercialize innovations at firms that would not be harmed by innovation. That's one of the reasons innovation often comes from outsiders and small businesses rather than big companies. Two, competition is an important incentive to innovation. Other things equal. Firms that regard their market position as contestable are more likely to innovate and vice versa. 
Three, firms that expect to be able to appropriate the substantial rewards for innovation, appropriate substantial rewards for innovation are more likely to innovate than firms that are unsure about appropriation. Appropriation is more likely if a firm can prevent copying by, for example, intellectual property, or can appropriate the fruits of even copyable innovation because of network effects, first mover advantages, or other entry barriers, or predictable scale over which to be rewarded for innovation, even if others can copy and enter. And the last point about scale is important because it is about scale, not market power, a distinction that I think even uh, Schumpeter himself seemed to recognize. Okay, so let's turn to the ability to innovate now, in addition to innovation. One set of important factors are the intangible capabilities emphasized by dynamic competition. But there are other important factors are tangible assets that need to be taken into account. They include intellectual property, financial resources, which might be evidenced in part by R&D budgets, and products in the pipeline. So to sum up, or at least to wrap up, I think from this learning and that combined with the teachings of the dynamic competition folks, as summarized a little bit in this paper, we can identify six propositions that can be used to enable antitrust institutions to take account of dynamic competition in deciding actual antitrust cases. All other things equal, first, or one, conduct that increases market power in the product space relevant to innovation and the innovation inquiry. If the benefited firm already has unique innovation abilities, what Rich Gilbert and I have called market power in the relevant R&D market, is likely to reduce innovation. Two, conduct that creates or maintains monopoly power in the relevant R&D market is likely to reduce innovation, especially if the firm has market power in the relevant product market. Three, conduct that increases a firm's abilities to innovate by combining innovation assets, whether tangible or intangible, or facilitating technological spillovers is likely to increase innovation. Four, conduct that reduces rivals' ability to innovate by reducing their access to R&D assets or otherwise is likely to reduce innovation. Five, conduct that increases a firm's ability to appropriate the fruits of innovation is likely to increase innovation. And six, conduct that reduces rivals' market access, increases entry barriers, or reduces a rival's ability to appropriate the fruits of its innovation is likely to decrease innovation. So these propositions, enriched by the work of the dynamic competition folks and their emphasis on, on the, the intangible uh, institutional and organizational qualities that are so central to growth and innovation and applied in legally relevant ways in the context of actual antitrust cases can improve antitrust analysis and outcomes by providing a basis for uh, prohibiting conduct that tends to reduce innovation and by protecting conduct that tends to increase it by, in other words, operationalizing dynamic competition. And that's it. Great, Doug, really appreciate that. Um, thank you for all the propositions. Usually it's only three, you gave us two times three, six, so that's great. And um, operationalizing is definitely where we want to go. So we really appreciate that. Thanks so much. Now I'd like to welcome Eleanor Fox. She's the Walter J. Derenberg Professor of Trade Regulation Emerita at uh, New York University School of Law. She's an expert in antitrust and competition policy and teaches, writes, and advises on competition policy in nations around the world and in international organizations. Welcome, Eleanor, over to you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to comment on this really interesting paper and enterprise. I will share some very simple slides. Um, so I want to tell you um, my very initial reactions to the paper and to the project, which of course we'll talk a whole lot more about. Um, my first reaction to basically to the project, and you'll probably tell me, I'm just not conceiving your concept of dynamic competition properly. Uh, my first reaction is um, there's a huge area within which the law already considers what I consider to be dynamic competition. It might not talk about capabilities. It doesn't talk about capabilities, but 
it does talk about unleashing the incentives to innovate, which of course can go back to capabilities. So this is the first concern I have with the project, um, like how much of it is new and where is it going and where is it going to be able to be implemented and usable in deciding the competition cases. Um, I first talk a little bit about some of the claims in the paper and my responses. I secondly will get back to wanting, keep feeling I need a better grasp on where your project is going. And thirdly, I will invoke a few cases in which I would like to claim that dynamic competition in the sense I just used it, which means unleashing the incentives to innovate in ways that almost always, and we can usually assume will be good for the welfare of society. Um, okay, so claims of the paper, of course, um, the first one, an obvious one, that dynamic competition is so much more important than price competition and ought to be recognized um, to control competition law analysis. The first part of that project and proposition, I think, you know, definitely right and has been recognized for so many years that innovation can do so much more for the welfare of people than simply keeping price down to the cost. Um, whether dynamic competition ought to be the controlling factor, I think is another serious question. Um, I think it's correct that competition law deals with price competition mostly, but not entirely. And that's very good for people and for the price of the goods and services we get, even if there's innovation coming in the longer term that will be doing things in different ways. Now, I want to go into the paper's claims on distinguishing Chicago school. I mean, both showing similarities, but also distinguishing. And I was much more important, I found much more important um, the distinctions. And thinking about your presentation of the distinctions, I also had this general feeling that you were talking about Chicago School from the point of view of one person, Frank Easterbrook, except for one point, um, which is regard for innovation, and then one person, Bob Bork. And I think Chicago School is much richer than you have presented it. I mean, not that Frank Easterbrook's vision is not rich, it's very rich, but it certainly is positioned at a certain point in thinking about, let's say, intervention, non-intervention. If you put Dick Posner's writing alongside Frank Easterbrook's writing, um, you'll get different propositions on a number of the points. Um, so let me go down a few and that, proposition I just made might be clear from several of the points. Uh, Chicago School is based on price output. Um, and maybe this goes into also not based on innovation. Um, Chicago School does limit a range of applications of antitrust according to price output. It does not necessarily mean that according to Chicago School thinkers, they're not interested in more and much more. And Easterbrook himself, as you do know, I think in your footnote, is extremely interested in innovation. And I actually happen to know this firsthand because um, my first very serious article, which is in Cornell in 1981, I was critical in the drafts. I was critical of certain people like Frank Easterbrook and thought I must send it to Frank before I finalize it and got back a beautiful single spaced letter, um, which was so generous and sympathetic generous, um, saying basically that while I was calling Chicago school um, static, 
The whole point of it, according to him, was to limit the antitrust intervention to let dynamic competition work. Um, so going down to institutions, I think you will get a very different answer from Dick Pesner and Frank Easterbrook. And, um, and that also goes into simple rules. I think, you know, simple rules are great. All sides think simple rules are great if you can get the right simple rule. And the right simple rule for Chicago is to limit the antitrust enforcement, a quote, right simple rule from some others on a different end of the continuum uh, would be more prohibitory. Um, the, that Chicago school believes strongly that markets will self-correct, I think is a really important point of your distinction um, because that is almost determinative of applications and outcomes by Chicago school thinkers. And very interesting that this is not a premise of dynamic competition um, project of yours. Um, that Chicago school permits all but cartels and mergers to monopoly. I think this is pretty strong, but not necessarily held by all players who are Chicago school players. Um, and I've already talked about the doubts about innovation. Uh, so I come out thinking of this particular paper, what I was interested in was I was very interested in the fact that you as an emerging school or thinkers um, do not believe market self-correct as a very strong principle you will apply. And I think that does distinguish you from Chicago, but I didn't want only why you're distinguished, how you're distinguished from Chicago. I want to know who you are and how you come to some or will to some conclusions that will be applicable to, so to decide competition problems. Um, that's really what this slide is about, this point two slide is about. I was not very convinced by the principles that you did recite in this paper. And I have to admit that I might have written other, read, sorry, others of your papers in the past. Um, but did not retain a very um, strong view of how you would come to principles that would be applicable. And I had a reaction that the principles that you recited in this paper have to fall short of what we must do in antitrust. Um, the idea that if relevant firms can grow equally absent the merger, the merger should be challenged I think is too strong a proposition. And I want to know why the merger should be challenged in terms of does it increase market power? What does it do to the market and competition? And similarly, if the firms cannot grow equally absent the merger, the merger should be allowed. And it's still possible that the firms would be, that the merger would be increasing market power, cutting off opportunities for entry that could be important, et cetera. All right, this slide is about why aren't we, why doesn't the law have a center of gravity that you could work within? Um, and there are various principles. Doug gave his version of some principles. This is like a, a different version of some principles that we already have in the law that seem to me some of them work well, some I might want to challenge, but they're definitely a framework for thinking about dynamic competition in the sense of innovation that will help people in markets. Um, so our law now assumes, this is US law, but not EU law, um, that firms need very free reign to invent. And therefore, if it's a monopoly case, very seldom intervention. Uh, in my view, Trinko goes too far. It says this. I think it goes too far. But the law does take into account this kind of prophylactic need to invent. And even though I think it goes too far, I think it's a very important principle to have in mind. Um, there are product changes that by our law are legal because they are innovation. And I think this is almost always a good principle. Um, 
if the innovation disrupts competition, it's good. You should not stop it. Um, take, for example, Uber's pricing low or high given the supply and demand uh, is just a very good change and introduction. Um, monopolist product changes that are predatory only are illegal. I thought uh, that you were definitely going to mention the Microsoft case, um, that most of the examples in Microsoft aren't that clear, but Microsoft was about innovation. It was not really about prices, and it was about Microsoft's use of its power of the operating system to try to prevent challenges to innovation that would uh, um, commoditize its own system. And it did various, it used various means to keep the dynamic competition out, and that was illegal. Uh, mergers raise big innovation problems. When they are raised, they are litigated. And this is another point I just wanted to raise, that this is another laboratory and a huge and interesting laboratory for trying to examine in the law with your experts there as to which set of facts you have the merger or you enjoin the merger is most likely to lead to the innovation that's likely to help people and save lives. Um, in view of all of the innovation problems that are being raised, um, our agencies are very sensitive to the fact of need for more knowledge and are bringing on board teams of technologists and others who can try to help give the data to figure out the um, how to resolve the competition, where are the competition problems and how to resolve them. So in conclusion, of course, research is good. And I admire you for being a research institution, researching the questions. And of course, unleashing innovation is critical. Um, and I think that it will, I will be following with great interest your outputs. You're coming to some, um, perhaps some conclusions on how you would apply your principles to solve certain problems. Um, I would be, well, let me put it this way, and this relates to Chicago School. If in fact, when you get operational principles, they always come out on the side of saying, for innovation incentives, we cannot intervene. Uh, this would be a clue of not taking account of the whole picture. Uh, and I believe from your paper that you want to take account of the whole picture. Doug mentioned this, um, that there are many um, aspects of other murders or uh, conduct that will suppress the innovation of the the firms without the power, the firms that don't have the problem of trying not to cannibalize themselves with innovation. So sometimes the um, the firms without power will give you more dynamic and dramatic uh, innovation. And I will be very interested to see how you come to conclusions to apply your frameworks uh, that will take account of both sides. Thanks. Great, thank you, Eleanor. That was very, very helpful. Yeah, we um, all you guys are pushing for more work. You know, you want us to write a big, thick book like Bork with the five hundred pages in small font. It's uh, it's good. So, um, thank you so much for that. Now, I'd like to welcome Keith Hilton. He's the William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Prof Professor of Boston University and Professor of Law at Boston University School of Law. He is a prolific scholar who is widely recognized for his work across a broad spectrum of topics in law and economics, including tort law, antitrust, labor law, intellectual property, civil procedure, and empirical legal analysis. That's a lot of work, Keith. You're never going to get any sleep with all that. Right. <laughs> Over to you, Keith. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to adopt all of the compliments that have already been given to the authors, and I won't repeat them myself. Um, and I'm going, going to focus on, uh, you know, questions about what are we talking about and, and maybe offer a few suggestions for what to look at, maybe, maybe a few critiques. Um, so we're talking about dynamic 
competition and, and what is that? I guess it has to do with innovation and taking innovation into account and in the antitrust laws. Now that problem, the problem of innovation has come up, has been you know under the surface and has come up in antitrust cases for a long time. I mean, we can go, go back and find pretty old cases. Let me give, give you an example. For example, the United Shoe monopolization case, Judge Wazanski's opinion, there's a lot of talk about innovation and about innovation within within United Shoes network and the effects, uh, the concerns that courts should have uh, with punishing United Shoe given its record on innovation. Um, we have other cases in, in addition to United Shoe, uh, Gerald Electronics, a famous tying case. Uh, that's a, a lot of discussion about innovation in that case and how the tying law should be modified to account for that. Um, we have specific rules, you know, the sort of the antitrust immunity for price fixing agreements that are part of patent and patent licensing contracts. Um, you know, you can consider that reflecting an innovation concern, though, though historically it's just a, a matter of property rights in the case law, but you can certainly understand it as, as reflecting an innovation concern. Um, and so, you know, one of the one of the concerns that's in the background is, you know, if you innovate and by innovation, your business becomes a dominant firm. Um, should we be worried about that innovation then leading to punishment under the antitrust laws? You know, or, or should we be worried about coming into a system where innovation allows the firm to grow and then by growing the firm? It comes into the crosshairs of the DOJ. You know, if, if that's if we if that's although it's that's it, obviously an exaggeration to describe the problem in such simple terms. But if if that's where we are in the law, that's troubling. You know, because it's you know to take a an example that may seem ridiculous. It's well known in China that if your business grows too big, you will become a ward of the CCP over time, and we don't want to have. We don't want to have an understanding of that sort um, in the U.S. Again, that may be uh, a little uh, it seem to be an exaggeration, but hopefully it gets across the concerns that are under the surface with uh, the effects of antitrust enforcement on innovation. So what is innovation? How should it be taken into account in antitrust? Well, I guess my approach, I, I take this approach in, in, in my textbook, is I, I try to break down antitrust enforcement by first looking at it as an economic problem. What is optimal antitrust for enforcement? How far should antitrust enforcement agencies go? And uh, I simplify matters by looking at it as a question of what is the optimal penalty that the state should apply on uh, antitrust violations? And the Chicago School uh, has addressed that question. And in the Chicago School literature, uh, it starts with looking at Gary Becker's work on optimal enforcement. And Gary Becker's work, uh, the approach of the, the, the bottom line implication of his work is that the optimal approach to enforcement is to internalize the externalities, the negative externalities of bad conduct, put it that way. And that's the general proposition. He applies it to crime, all sorts of bad, uh, intentionally bad conduct. And that rule applies to antitrust as well. Um, and Bill, Bill Landis has a paper in which he takes the Becker framework and applies it to antitrust and answers the question, what is the optimal rule for penalization under, under antitrust? And he delivers the same Becker proposition, internalize the negative externalities of antitrust violations. That would mean having a penalty that internalizes the consumer loss, the, the transfer of wealth from consumers, and the deadweight loss. So the sum of the transfer and the deadweight loss is the optimal penalty, optimal, call it a Becker penalty, according to Bill Landis in his paper. So if we, if we take this general Becker framework and say, well, what we really want to do is internalize the negative externalities of bad conduct, you know, of antitrust violations. In the static Chicago school framework, 
it's just internalized consumer harm and dead the sum of consumer harm and dead weight loss. And now you can change that, you can modify that approach. You can say, well, in some cases enforcement is uncertain. And so you need to you need to boost that penalty by taking you know, into account the uncertainty of enforcement. So if the, the probability of enforcement is only 50%, you may, be, may need to double the penalty to take that in, uncertainty into account. But the basic framework remains the same uh, as we started off, you know, of internal, internalizing uh, negative externalities. Um, now, into that framework, we introduce innovation and we ask, well, so how does that change the this Gary Becker, Bill Landis, Dick Posner, uh, Chicago framework for antitrust enforcement? And again, this is just a highly simplified, you know, uh, stylized model of antitrust enforcement that I'm talking about. But it's it's pretty simple and has broad application. So what do we? How do we take innovation into account? And so I looked at that with a paper in a paper that I, I wrote with um, former uh, PhD advisee uh, who teaches at uh, Indiana Business School right now. Uh, her name is Haijin Lin L I N. So we wrote a paper uh, that we published in the Journal of Competition Law and Economics in 2013 on innovation and optimal punishment, and we looked at the Becker penalty framework under that uh, under that under the circumstance where the uh, antitrust, viol antitrust violator has also innovated. And the innovation we're considering is innovation where the antitrust violator has invested to create the very market that the antitrust violator monopolizes. So we ask, what, what has the Becker framework changed under that context? And what we showed is that the optimal penalty in the Becker framework is a weighted average of the Becker penalty which internalizes, or the Becker-Landis penalty, Becker-Landis-Posner penalty, which internalizes consumer harm and dead weight loss, and a subsidy, which internalizes the gain given to consumers, the innovation gain to consumers. And the innovation gain to consumers is the residual consumer surplus that resulted from the innovation to begin with. So that's the base. So that's sort of like the basic framework for, for in, you know, my view for incorporating innovation into antitrust enforcement. You start with that basic mod modification of the Becker framework uh, in antitrust. Um, and so what that suggests, since you since the optimal penalty is in general a weighted average of the Becker penalty of the of the, in, the internalizes the negative externalities. And another penalty that another subsidy that internalizes the positive externalities, that means you're you're modif you're weakening punishment. You're you're for these innovation contexts, you know, you are weakening punishment for sure. Um, and the extent to which you're weakening punishment depends on how important this innovation benefit is relative to the um, you know the harm to consumers. Um, and so uh, the 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 penalty formula turns out to be more complicated. Uh, so it's harder to to implement this in some simple framework. So for example, you could take the Becker penalty and you could march through the antitrust enforcement laws and ask, you know, how close are our real enforcement rules to what would be required under the Becker land is enforcement framework you can do that i did that i do that exercise in in the the uh the third chapter of my antitrust uh textbook um so you, you can do that you know it's what's harder to do that exercise if you're taking into account an innovation subsidy it's much harder to do that to march through the through the laws and and see whether the laws are consistent but still the innovation the notion that you'd have an innovation subsidy is helpful in a heuristic matter and sort of just thinking through how should we approach enforcement in this context. Now note that when I'm thinking about the innovation of the firm that, that becomes the monopoly, I'm talking about the innovation of the target, of the firm that would be the target of the enforcement agencies. 
that framework does not take into account the innovation of rival firms okay but we can do that you can that's another step to include into the model and we can treat the innovation of rival firms as derivative effects um, that is the harm to innovation by rival firms as derivative effects secondary effects resulting from the firms the primary firms monopolization so in an innovation framework, I think you have to take into account, you certainly have to take into account the primary effect of innovation, which is the dominant firm's innovation and its effect on consumers, and also the secondary effects, which would be the negative impact on the innovation incentives of rival firms resulting from the dominant firm's anti-competitive conduct. So there'd be primary effects and secondary effects. One problem with a lot of the discussion in antitrust today, certainly from the neo Brandeisian camp, is they want to take into account the secondary effects, but they want to ignore the primary effects. To me, that's an inconsistent approach to innovation, taking antitrust innovation into account in antitrust. If you're going to take antitrust innovation into account in antitrust, then I think you start with the primary effects and you build into that the secondary effects. You don't start with the secondary effects and ignore the primary effects of innovation. Okay, so uh, that's a basic view of, of, you know, sort of a starting point for incorporating innovation in a mathematical model of enforcement that forms the basis of a theory of antitrust, of optimal antitrust enforcement. Um, and, and, and then when you try to operationalize it, because it's kind of complicated, at this stage, you're sort of using it again as a heuristic device, you're, you're thinking, okay, let's go through the cases. Let's go through our real enforcement actions and ask ourselves, are we taking innovation into account? What would we do if we took innovation into account? Where are we taking innovation into account? Um, and we've talked about some of these cases already. We have a few cases out there that, that you know, as I, as I mentioned at the very start, we have cases, we have old cases, we have cases going back, you know, for a long time that touch on innovation under the surface that it's 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 mentioned but you know it's not uh, brought in, in as a central concern in fact judge wasanski's opinion in united shoe touches on the innovation talks about the innovation issue and says but you know we're i'm going to set that aside because that innovation is just a it's just a social benefit that we can't incorporate into the antitrust laws it's outside of the competition framework it's you know we think of about what chicago board of trade says for us antitrust law it says we we're only going to, going to consider competition and so judge wanansky says well this social this innovation story that united shoe has we're we're just going to set that aside and ignore it because it really doesn't fit into the competition framework. Um, so, and that's, that. I think that's been the dominant trend in antitrust law, but, but we have some cases now that actually touch on innovation, try to bring innovation into account in antitrust enforcement. Trinco, we, we've mentioned that already. Trinco is one such case. Trinco, the, the court talks about innovation. And the main reason for taking innovation into account in Trinco was to push against the essential facility doctrine that had developed in lower courts in the U.S. and you know much of Scalia's opinion in Trinco is an attack on the essential facility doctrine and uh, pointing out the anti-innovation incentives created by the essential facility doctrine. Uh, it's not a thorough attack on it because uh, he does allow some room for the essential facility doctrine to continue to exist. And under Trinco, the, that doctrine continues to exist in a very narrow pocket when the plaintiffs can bring facts that show that there's really a specific intent to monopolize. There's really no possible pro-competitive or efficiency explanation for what the, uh, that it, in fact, I think I, I would read Trinco as going further. Not only is there no possible pro-competitive or efficiency justification, but there's no non, there's no, um, non-harmful <laughs> explanation theory that would explain what the defendants are doing. Because in the end, I think uh, Scalia, Scalia says in Trinco 
you know, well, you know, the fact that that uh, the Verizon, um, the fact that the defendant, uh, you know, uh, wasn't quick to uh, hook up the rivals to the the um, com the communications network. You know, that may have reflected the fact that they were kind of lazy under the incentives, under the regulatory incentives. They were just, they were just being lazy under the regulatory incentives because there's no real monetary incentive to really help out your rivals. Um, so, you know, we're, Scalia's argument is we're not going to pose a duty on the defendant to get up and help out the rivals when the regulatory framework sort of squeezes that in incentive out. Away from the uh, away out of the uh, 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 the framework for the for the defendant. So that, in that sense, I think you know Trinco is an effort to again deal with directly with the innovation problem, uh, and at the same time uh, keep some of the existing framework for uh, for antitrust. Um, so although Trinco reads as a thorough attack on the central facility doctrine, it does leave some piece of the central facility doctrine uh, intact under a specific narrow set of facts. Trinco has sort of been misread uh, in link line in a more expansive way. So, you know, uh, I think some of the critiques of Trinco that say it goes too far, I think those critiques are based on what the court said in link line, which expands Trinco, take its offers an expansive reading of Trinco. Uh, I think if you go back to the original Trinco opinion, I, I don't view that as going too far at all. I think I think Trinco does. Sorry, Linkline does take Trinco and 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 expand it uh, and describe it in expansive language that uh, arguably arguably goes too too far. Um, okay, uh, I'll try to wrap this up. I, I don't have much more to say. I mean, I was just going to mention some of the cases. I mean, e e even Alcoa, even their innovation concerns, even in the Al even in Judge Hand's Alcoa opinion, but you know, Judge, Judge Hand was was very dismissive of any of those concerns, and uh, you know, uh, you know, his whole effort was to to reverse the position that antitrust had taken before 1945, um, you know, uh, under Section Two. So, so uh, Hand was completely dismissive of Alcoa's innovation arguments. Um, what else? Uh, I mentioned Gerald already. Um, you know, the you can even refer to, you know, the section in the section one area, you can refer to the BMI doctrine, you know, which, which says that uh, the courts will find an exception to the per se prohibition, um, you know, on market allocation or, or price fixing where that where that coordination is necessary for the introduction of a of a new product or a new market, if you want to put it that way. Um, so that so you could say the BMI rule reflects innovation being taken into account in U.S. antitrust law in the Section One context. Um, Microsoft, you know, Mike, there is an and obviously there's an innovation issue in in Microsoft, and and Microsoft definitely you know, raises the, in the bigger picture of it, it raises the question, you know, does, if a firm grows large through innovation, does it then become a subject for antitrust enforcement? Is that the reward for, in, for technological innovation to become a, a target for antitrust enforcement? You know, hopefully that's not where we, where we are. Um, the one thing that, could, that I guess can be said about Bill Gates, about Microsoft and Bill Gates, is that Bill Gates had, you know, be, become publicly had publicly become known for having a reputation uh, of being paranoid about competition and looking you know at competitors even the the you know weakest competitors as possible threats and figuring out ways to screw those competitors before they got to him um, so I think Microsoft may be a special case because of the kind of you know psychological aspects of Bill Gates uh, and, and the, what people what presumably was well known about the way he ran Microsoft, but if we if we look at Microsoft or we step away from that part of it, then yes, Microsoft raises huge innovation issues. Uh, Trinco, to some extent, uh, deals with some of those issues in Microsoft, 
uh, by, you know, by saying that, well, we're, we're really going to be careful about imposing a duty to deal in the antitrust laws. But then we have the problem again now with Google and litigation against Google and against Apple. We have, we have the problem whether um, Google and Apple, all, all of this litigation they're facing is reflecting this paradox that if you innovate, you become dominant in some sector and then you become a target of antitrust enforcement uh, for whatever you do. Um, when, when whatever you do means you're trying to, you know, basically reap a sufficient amount of the rewards from innovation to make it worthwhile to continue to invest uh, in in the innovative product. Um, okay, there's more to say, but maybe I'll, I'll stop here. All right, thanks a lot, Keith. Really appreciate it. Thanks for going back to Becker and Landis and I think that's a good framework to use, as you mentioned, and the primary and secondary effects. There's all these feet, there's all these loops, and usually what happens is people focus on one side of the equation or not another. They miss the holistic perspective, which uh, I think Eleanor mentioned as well. That, and we, I agree, that's what we we want to make sure that we count all the variables. Um, so thanks a lot. Certainly, uh, last but not least, I would like to welcome Renata Hesse. She is a partner and co-head of the antitrust group at Sullivan and Cromwell. Her practice focuses on antitrust counseling, cartels, and merger clearance. Renata joined Sullivan and Cromwell following a distinguished career in, in the government, including leading the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. Welcome, Renata. Great to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm batting cleanup here, and um, as the only as the only practicing lawyer, I think on uh, on this, um, I might be a little bit uh, too practical. Um, but I'm also, I think, going to be a little bit br brief because I know we want to get to questions and and discussion. Um, <clears throat> I I really appreciated the paper's desire to, in my view, see if there is an economic framework that we can describe that charts a middle path between the Chicago School and the neo um, uh, uh I'm not sure it's a school yet, uh, but school that we see um, that we see today. And and that's something that uh, is it's an effort that's kind of near and dear to my heart because. For those of you who know me, you know that I tend to see things um, as not black or white, but always somewhere in the middle. Um, and and I think uh, you know I really appreciate the idea that um, dynamic competition, particular particularly um, competition's impact on innovation as being a you know a key. Uh, driver, and it should be a key driver of how we think about uh, antitrust enforcement um, in the U.S. and abroad. Um, I am a believer in the notion that uh, competition drives the innovation economy. I think that's really true, and um, uh, but I also think it's really difficult to measure. So to me, you know, when you think about the Chicago School, I think one of the benefits that the Chicago School really promised and to a certain extent delivered was that you could reduce some of these complicated judgment questions that um, people have to make when they're looking at um, uh, behavior in the marketplace, whether it's a transaction or conduct, um, to somewhat simple rules. And that um, was, I, I think the idea there was, well, let's create more measurability <clears throat> and potentially more predictability um, for business. And that that's going to be a good thing because as a general matter, um, that will lead us to where there's uncertainty, uh, defer to the market uh, to solve whatever issue uh, there is out there. Um, I think I like uh, the authors am not uh, convinced that the market always remedies all ills. Um, and I'm also not convinced that competition law and antitrust is the remedy for all of the uh, 
things that ail our society and our economy, particularly today. Um, there's no question that some of these large technology firms that are under attack are in fact innovating and are delivering products and services to consumers that consumers really like. I don't think that inoculates them from antitrust scrutiny necessarily, but I do think part of the stretch to condemn all things that large businesses do um, has been to um, under acknowledge uh, what uh, some of these companies deliver to the marketplace. Um, <clears throat> so I guess, you know, I think the thing that I, um, I wonder the most about all of this really, and I, this may be the, the comment that I make and, and that I, that I finish with is, you know, reading the paper, I felt like, um, both in the description of the Chicago school and also in description of, uh, dynamic competition and and what it what it could deliver. Um, we have this idea that the world is uh, sort of limitless and that uh, wealth creation and innovation and um, economic growth are are limit are limitless in some way. And I wonder how all of these theories <clears throat> work in a world of scarcity. And I think that. Um, that's sort of where we find ourselves today, not scarcity in the, in the, you know, true sense, but I think the, the, the issue that the neo-Brandesians are trying to address is a world where, um, it doesn't seem like competition and markets are actually working for all consumers and are delivering benefits to all consumers. And I think it's, it is that's a function to a certain degree of the fact that um, the allocation of the benefits of our marketplace um, has left some people behind. And to me, that's a critical piece that we need to think about how to how to weave that into um, this middle ground economic theory and so that we can answer that question. Um, about how how are we going to um, make sure that not that we that we solve all problems, but at least that we think about competition and competition enforcement and innovation um, in a way that's holistic uh, regarding the consumer, all kinds of consumers out in the marketplace. Um, so uh, kudos to the, the authors for uh, starting what I think is a really important discussion around um, how do we think about this, this middle ground um, and how can we actually put some economic thinking around measuring um, what the impact of um, antitrust is on innovation and on on firms um, who are who are uh, who are driving our economy. The, the, I guess the one last thing I'll say is I love the idea of taking a slightly longer term um, approach to looking at um, the capabilities of firms and trying to protect uh, longer term uh, uh, goals. Um, it reminds me, and Doug, this may be. Uh, you, this may spark a memory for you too of, you know, of thinking about e so-called equally efficient rivals in the in the um, airline context during the predatory conduct case of U.S. v. American Airlines. And I always wondered in that case whether there was an eco economic model that would allow a less efficient rival to have the time to grow into an equally efficient or more efficient rival. Um, and at the time, it didn't seem like the economic models, or at least the way people were thinking about antitrust and predation in particular, there wasn't a lot of room for that there. So uh, thank you for having me. And um, those are my, my practicing lawyer practical comments. <laughs> Great. Thanks so, so, thanks so much, Renata. And uh, Nicola and I call ourselves the rational centrists. So we like the center. Or do we call ourselves radical centers because there's not that many people in the middle anymore? Nicola, which one is it? 
But uh, let me just, as a rhetorical question, let me uh, let me just finish up the first part here and say thanks a lot to all of our uh, speakers for participating. We'll be back with the next webinar on DCI on April 10th and 11th on uh, Gen AI. So thanks everyone for participating and now we'll move to overtime.